Welcome to Documenting State Violence, Building Archives of Survival, the third event in the spring series of this year-long oral history workshop series, Oral History and Power. Ooh, power. <laughs> Something happened with my breath there. Um, my name is Carlin Leozia, and I help to coordinate this series alongside Amy Staracheski. Um, and I also teach the accompanying course here in the Oral History MA program. Um, I am joining you this afternoon from just above the floodplains of the Snake River, um, which is in the ancestral lands of the um, Shoshone Bannock, the Eastern Shoshone, and the Cheyenne peoples, um, aka Western Wyoming. Um, wow, okay. <laughs> I need to figure out how to breathe and talk while I do these things. Um, if anyone has any tips, send them my way. Um, I am grateful to be here and uh, to be taught and sustained by the Snake River um, and also to learn from the way that the indigenous peoples whose ancestors um, were violently ousted from this place, um, to learn from how they've continued to fight to care for the Snake River um, and these lands. In particular, I, um, I'm sort of keeping an eye on these days, um, the Shoshone Bannock tribes are currently advocating for um, the removal of four dams that are south of here along the Snake um, in that Idaho state legislature. So that's been uh, awesome for me to be here and um, learning from that example. Um, as a member of OMA, I'm also still situated and dependent on the unceded lands of the Lenape people um, who were violently dispossessed from the place we now call New York City. Um, and as a program, we honor their roots before and below Columbia's campus um, and the strength it has taken to resist and rebuild both there and elsewhere. Um, and as oral historians, we also wanna acknowledge that the roots of our practice uh, are in, in indigenous oral history um, and to acknowledge the ways in which our field has excluded indigenous peoples and practices by displacing and repositioning them as sort of merely oral tradition. Um, I personally hear a lot of parallels in that history of power fraught narrative repositioning with the one that we'll be discussing tonight. And I imagine um, tonight's audience might be especially interested to learn more about that. So if that's the case, um, we as a program highly recommend Napia Makwika's work um, as sort of a starting place to continue or um, yeah, either a starting place or a continuance um, for that unlearning and what to replace it with. Um, so I'll put that in the chat. There's um, a whole book, but I, I especially recommend starting with chapter two. If you're one of those people who's like, oh my gosh, a whole book, yes, I'll read that. And then it sits there forever and ever. Um, chapter two is, is a good place to start there. Um, those of you who've attended previous workshops will no doubt hear the connections of tonight's event, uh, documenting state violence, building archives of survival with the conversation that we've been having all year about systems of harm and violence and how to subvert them, how to heal. Um, and because tonight's topics are especially heavy and tough in that regard, I wanted to create, um, as we did last time, just a moment to sort of center ourselves uh, together. So I invite you to um, join me in taking three deep breaths um, at your own pace. Thank you. Clearly I needed that this evening in particular. Um, so I hope others found that uh, restorative as well. I always forget to breathe and it's it's so easy and so helpful. Um, so please, as tonight goes on, if you find yourself needing to do that, please do so. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so Gabriel Solis. Um, Gabriel, Gabriel has been the executive director of the Texas After Violence Project since 2016. Before that, he worked as a post-conviction migration specialist for the Office of Capital and Forensic Ritz, a criminal justice policy researcher at the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law, and a project coordinator of the Guantanamo Bay Oral History Project at the Columbia Center for Oral History Research. So welcome back, Gabriel. 
Um, his writings have appeared lots of rad places and won prizes. Um, and he's also currently serving as the archival consultant for the Ford Foundation's Reclaiming the Border Narrative Initiative. Um, so please join me in welcoming Gabriel Solis. Thank you so much. It's really good to be here. I, I just got a thing on my computer that my internet is unstable. So if I hop off, give me a minute and I'll come right back on. Um, uh, it is really, really nice to be here. I, um, as Carla mentioned, I used to work with Mary Marshall, who I see my old friend here um, on, on the call um, and learned so much working with her and with others at the Columbia Center for Oral History Research. So it's always a pleasure and an honor to come back and pretty much anytime y'all ask, I'll come. So, <laughs> um, so it's good to be here. Um, I, uh, there's so much to, to cover when we're talking about oral history and power, particularly within the context of state violence. And so I, to be perfectly honest, I struggled a little bit trying to figure out what to focus on um, in the short time we have together. I was sort of all over the place. I wanted to talk through some new ideas that I'm thinking about. Um, but honestly, I just decided to, I think the best way to get at um, issues around oral history and power, particularly issues that I'm interested about, um, you know, ethical oral history, ethical documentation, ethical archiving, changing narratives. I think the best way to work through those and, you know, for me is to just sort of talk about our work at TAVP, go through some of our projects, and I can just be open and honest with you all about how our thinking and how our approach to the work has shifted over the years. And um, I hope that that, would be, that that will be useful to you all. Um, so if you have any questions, I, I'm cool with just sort of having a conversation. So if Carlin, if you're up for it, if, you can, if there's a question that you know, you, maybe you could and, you know, let me know so I don't have to try to keep track of the chat. Yeah. Um, so thank you again for having me. It's really nice to be here. And, um, uh, yeah, and I, I will say at the top, too, that um, there's much more about our work you can find on our website, on our social media, um, our, so please um, stay in touch with us and uh, get, in, get, get in touch with us if you have any questions about anything that we're working on. So I have a little PowerPoint. There's no text, uh, just images. Um, so I will um, open it up here. Just give me one second. Okay, so, you know, this is, um, I want to talk about sort of the early days of the organization. You know, in the early days, we, um, we the, the project was founded specifically to document the impacts of the death penalty on um, people whose lives have been, um, who've been impacted by the death penalty. So in those early years, we did a lot of interviews with the family members of people who've been murdered, the family members of people who've been um, sentenced to death and executed, but also defense lawyers, prosecutors, jurors, corrections officers who participated um, in executions. And the idea there was um, really to try to give the public a deeper understanding of the, all of the devastation that the death penalty causes to individuals, families, and communities. And, you know, I was saying in the, in the last hour that, you know, uh, I remember I was involved with TAVP as an, as an undergraduate intern a long time ago. And, you know, I remember traveling around the state of Texas with our little handicam and going into people's homes and doing, you know, these very difficult, emotionally intense oral histories with people who, many times we're still grieving um, and and then you know uh, getting in the car and coming home and um, it was rough work it was tough and I, um, I've been open and very honest about the impact of that uh, on me as a, as a witness and um, but also try to be very honest about um, you know the fact that that is the reason why this work is so important is because 
it's the potential to transform people who engage with these stories um, for better or for worse. And so I, you know, that experience for me was very formative in those early years, in my early 20s. Um, and so this photo that you're seeing here, it's not from those years, it's from 2013, but it's, it's with one of our interviews um, conducted by uh, Rebecca Lawrence, who um, was with the project for many years, um, interviewing Rice Buyan, who um, was shot by um, Mark Stroman in the aftermath of 9-11, and then um, very, very complex and, and interesting story. But um, Rice basically became an advocate on behalf of Mark Stroman to try to save his life after he was given a death sentence. And so um, my colleague uh, did a, I think like an eight hour <laughs> history with him about that experience. But, um, you know, and I, I will say there that um, the founder of, the, of TAVP, um, himself a capital, longtime capital defense lawyer, and, you know, the, the experience with the death penalty had impacted his life as well. And he, he wanted to found this, to, to start this project, to document this. And um, we were playing racquetball a couple of years together and we were talking about the importance of this work. And he quoted Thomas Hardy, a poet saying, if a way to the better there be, it exacts a full look at the worst. And I think that was his approach in those early days to the work was really, um, believing that, that, that we had to fully look at the, the worst um, if we were going to move on, to evolve, to eventually get rid of, um, particularly in this case, the death penalty. So I, uh, I, I was away from the project for a while. I, as Carly mentioned, I went to New York City and um, learned a lot there with Mary Marshall and others at, at Columbia. Um, I also worked on um, death penalty cases as a mitigation investigator. And one thing I always like to say when I'm talking about our work at TAVP was I was such a better mitigation investigator because of my work in oral history. I mean, it, you know, the role of the mitigation investigator, I, I was post conviction. So our role was to go into communities, to build trust, to build relationships with families and friends of people who'd been given a death sentence, and essentially to tell the full story as best as we could about our client's life and upbringing, um, to try to convince the judge in this case, because it was post-conviction, so the jury had already uh, come down with a death sentence, basically to try to tell the judge, look, the jury never heard this story before at trial. And so this, you know, our client deserves to have this story told and people to know the story before they bring down a judgment like, you know, um, like a death sentence. So I was such a more effective mitigation investigator in those years because of the work, because of the oral history work that I had done in the years before. And I, there's so much more to say about that, about the overlaps and the tensions and where they don't overlap, but I won't get into that now. Um, but I will say that, um, when I came back to TAVP in 2016, um, we had decided that we were gonna look broadly at state violence and um, uh, not just focus on the death penalty. And so pretty early on, we, um, we did a uh, collaborative project um, with a group called the Texas Justice Initiative, which is a data initiative and they were tracking um, in custody deaths. So that's when people die in police jail or prison custody. And um, they had the data, we had the, the skills around um, going out and, and trying to responsibly and ethically document stories. And so we identified a couple of issues um, that we wanted to do some interviewing around. Um, and those issues um, were uh, police shootings. Obviously this is, um, a huge problem um, and issue in our society, police shootings of unarmed black and brown people, um, women who are pregnant or who've given birth while incarcerated. Um, the categorization of cu in custody deaths as natural causes was something that happened, you know, uh, uh, an agency would, would categorize it as a natural cause, but there was a lot of red flags around that. Obviously, if someone is healthy and goes into jail, then ends up dying while incarcerated. And then um, 
the rate of suicides at Harris County Jail, which is Houston. And so those are the issues that we decided to do, to, to try to do some interviewing around. Um, and we did, and, and this photo that you're seeing now is this incredible woman named Sarah. Um, her father was killed by police when, in 1993 when she was 10, she witnessed it. Um, and the, the story is just incredible. I mean, not only of telling you know, who he was um, going through that night, but also in particularly who she became as a, as a person and as an adult and as an activist, um, as a co-founder of a group called Mothers Against Police Brutality as a result of that experience. And this is, all, this is always, this is one of my favorite interviews that I've done for a lot of reasons, but um, uh, she's just incredible. And it was, a, it was an honor to be able to, um, to do that, that oral history with her. And um, yeah, so that, that was, um, again, a project where we were really, experimenting with expanding out and, and trying to, to, to sort of bring our approach to oral history um, to, uh, to other areas. And one thing I'll note here, which I mentioned in the last hour is, you know, we've been, um, we've been particularly uh, interested in trying to always keep in practice the best parts of oral history for, that we find in terms of its ethics, its principles, and many of the practices that the practitioners have you know, developed and practiced over the years, but also feeling okay and comfortable with moving away from the method when the project needs that. And so it's been interesting how the, uh, one of the OMA students in the last uh, hour asked, you know, how our work has changed and our work has changed over the years in a lot of ways, but this is one particular way where we, I feel like we were lucky enough to be able to keep what we love of, of oral history as a method, but also um, be comfortable with adapting it and, sh and molding it to the needs of the project, particularly around issues of state violence and the impacts of state violence. And so for this project, one of the things I mentioned was that in many ways we were somewhere on a spectrum between oral history and investigative journalism because we were we were really trying to figure out what happened to um, our interviewees' loved ones and trying to get information about what happened. And oftentimes they were so desperate to, to get more of that information. So it wasn't just the telling of what happened and their experience and you know the, the meaning making aspects of the of the narrative, but also, you're documenting in real time families really, really desperate for to know what happened to their loved one. Um, and, you know, this reminds me of another incredible group that if you don't know about, um, if you don't know about them to check them out, they're called the Forced Trajectory Project. Um, and, uh, you know, their name Forced Trajectory is precisely this. It's when people who lose a loved one, particularly to police shootings, their lives take on this new forced trajectory. They've become investigators, they become activists, they become advocates. And that's what we see a lot in our work too. This is another uh, photo of um, two um, uh, people that we interviewed, um, Nisha and Melanie Young, a devastating story. Um, uh, they're Nisha's cousin and Melanie's brother, um, you know, the, the county says he, he took his own life while incarcerated in the Harris County Jail. The family totally rejects that and thinks he was killed. And, and um, you know, we, they're still trying to find answers. You know, there's been all kinds of investigations, obviously, and um, they're ch still trying to figure out what happened um, with their loved one. And it was interesting to sit with them and to document and witness their story because, you know, again, on the one hand, there's the important aspect of them countering the narrative that would put, was put out about their brother and cousin um, as this sort of violent person. And he, they were saying, no, would be, actually, he would go and um, he would go and he'd see a stray dog. He'd bring him to our house to feed him and take care. We had 14 dogs in our backyard, you know, and stuff like that. So, um, but also just their very in real time struggle to like, again, desperate for, desperate for for information about what really happened.
this is a good friend of mine, Jorge, and, and he, um, I, I decided to include a, a photo of him here that my colleague Jane took because uh, he helped us um, with our next another project that we'd wanted to um, that we wanted to uh, to do around the impacts of incarceration. And literally, it happened one morning. We were having coffee together, and you know, he, he's a he's a formerly incarcerated advocate. He's a, a leading um, a leading advocate and activist for decarceration in Texas, just an incredible guy. And we were talking and he recognized the importance of TAVP's works, particularly around interviewing oral history, stories, community archiving. And, you know, we basically came up with this idea that, you know, sometimes maybe we're not the best suited to do the interviewing ourselves. You know, sometimes people who are directly impacted by whatever issue it is that we're looking into or documenting might be better suited to, to do the interview. And so we came up with this idea um, that TAVP would shift our approach a little bit. You know, we, in, in past years, we had always done the interviewing ourselves, the coordination, the planning. Um, and we decided to go to this group called the Texas Advocates for Justice, um, which was a group of formerly incarcerated people and their, their loved ones. And um, essentially to say, how can stories, storytelling, your personal experience help you in your advocacy, in your decarceration ab advocacy or your abolition advocacy? And TAVP very much became a sort of a coordinator or a facilitator of that project. Um, and we, 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 we um, trained several members of Texas Advocates for Justice sort of in our approach to, to oral history interviewing. We did trainings on how to operate video and audio equipment, how to mic up people, how to sort of do the lighting. Um, and we got a little bit of funding so that we were able to, to compensate everybody for their time. And, you know, we, and we stepped back essentially, and it was really incredible what resulted. I mean, no surprise. I think to people who do participatory action research work or, you know, um, uh, or do, you know, participatory oral history work, you know, this was our first time sort of experimenting with that. And it was really incredible. And, um, you know, I think one of the, uh, one of the unintended results of the project that I, several participants told us about was that it actually made them more effective organizers and advocates. You know, they said, I always knew this person that was with me at these meetings, but I didn't really know them. I didn't know their story. And, and so it was really cool to, um, uh, to hear that feedback. And, you know, um, I think having done that project, we recognize that maybe there was really no going back to the old way of our doing the work. You know, I think that obviously there's going to be times where we want to step in and, and participate in an interview as an interviewer. Um, well, all, you know, for, for many of us, like that's what we really love to do. I love to do it. Um, but I think that wherever possible, you know, in the last couple of years, we've really embraced this approach. And in fact, now, one of the things that we're working on is developing a community advisory council um, uh, particularly to help not only uh, project level, you know, input and decision making um, and guidance, but, you know, I hope one day in the not too far future sort of organizational level, helping us think through what projects to pursue, how are we going to pursue them, what are the goals or the objectives of the projects and how can we get there. Um, I think that's only, I mean, I know that that would only strengthen the work in really interesting ways. And um, uh, so, so we're starting that now, particularly on this project where we are, work, we are gonna be working with a community advisory group to, um, to co-design um, uh, learning content from our archive that activists and advocates and memory workers can use in their work. And so again, recognizing that, sure, we could, do, do that ourselves, but I think wherever we have input from our community, and in this case, our community is people whose lives have been directly impacted by violence and state violence to help us with that, the better. 
I'm going to stop here for a second and just see if there's any questions, any questions at this point. I was just going to put a reminder in the chat. Okay, yeah, I can't see the chat with my PowerPoint, so you might have to just interrupt. Me. Okay, there aren't any in here yet, but I was just okay. going to put a reminder. Cool. Yeah. Great. This was a little publication that we put out as a, a, a um, uh, with that project where we um, featured some of the portraits and um, some quotes and some information about some of our interviewees that participated in this project. And you know, I guess another way that our work has shifted over the years was I think in the early days, I think we we thought a lot of our work was done once the interview made it to the archive, but pretty quickly we realized that there's so much more that we ought to do if we can um, to, you know, some say activate um, the, the, the materials in different ways. Um, so whether it's in these publications or in, you know, short edited uh, videos that we've put out or working with artists in residence or writers in residence that we now have, we're always trying to think of ways to get the information um, and the stories out as far and as wide as possible. This was a, so we shifted, again, we shifted focus um, in 2019 a little bit where we, we, um, we uh, decided to focus very on something very specific. You know, in the early days of the organization, we, um, focus a lot on the traumatic impacts of the death penalty, as I said, both for loved ones of people who've been executed and sentenced to death, but also on murder victim survivors and, and others who had been impacted. So we had done a lot of that work and other um, researchers and, and writers and others had done a lot of that work as well. And so what we decided to do with um, our good friend, Susanna Sheffer, who's now helping us coordinate this project, which is we're calling the Access to Treatment Project was specifically to look at barriers to mental health treatment for families of people who've been sentenced to death or executed. And so we did a series of interviews specifically on this issue. So again, this is an, an area where we, we were not taking the life history approach necessarily. We're really wanting to focus in on a, a, um, this specific um, issue, but I will say also that we had a sort of two different protocols here, depending on um, who we were interviewing. So when there was no active case, when an execution had already been carried out and therefore there was no potential to create any evidence that could be harmful to the people we're working with, then we were obviously interested in taking the broader, more expansive approach. Um, to the interviewing, but, and that has been our policy from the beginning. Um, here, though, we decided we wanted to also capture the experiences of people who were currently on death row. And so we adapted our protocol a little bit and did not follow our usual protocol. These interviews would never make it to the archive um, and other measures that we took um, to make sure that we could protect the interviewees at all costs um, to basically make sure that there was no risk at all um, to creating any kind of potential to harm them or their loved one or their, their appeals or whatever the case may be. So um, this was, an, again, an interesting project from the organization's perspective because we were really focusing in on this very specific issue and the stories, the experiences were always at the core of what we were, want, or what we wanted to do, what we were doing. Um, and so Susanna and uh, Walter Long, both at the time were board members and Susanna is an expert in this area. Um, and so she authored a report that we put out in 2019 called Nobody to Talk To, it's on our website. Um, and one thing that I'll say that, you know, resulted from this work, uh, which, I, which is significant, um, is a formal recognition you know, um, uh, by trauma therapists and um, hopefully 
trauma organiz trauma therapist organizations, national organizations to recognize these families as an underserved population. And then really, you know, what we want to focus on next is trying to do our part to get help facilitate um, getting uh, these families access to mental health treatment. And one partnership that we're working on right now that Susanna is spearheading is a partnership with a university in Austin to train their, ma their master's uh, counseling students um, to welcome this, this uh, families into their care, to be more prepared to work with them, et cetera. And so again, I, I wanted to highlight this project because it's an interesting way of the, that, the ways that our work has shifted and adapted over the years with the stories always being at the center. This was a this was an interview uh, 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 part of the the project that I mentioned about impacts of incarceration. Um, incredible interview that Sybil did. Um, Sybil's a formerly incarcerated advocate. Um, Mignon is this incredible person um, who not only lost a son to murder, but her other son, son is incarcerated. And so, you know, I think people come to this work and they think that it's going to be either this or that. You know, it's 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 clear cut some of these issues, you're either for this or against that, you know, and really that's not the case. I mean, Mignon's story is a perfect example of someone who on the one hand is an advocate or an activist for decarceration. She's trying to get, you know, she's recognizing the, you know, the devastation that incarceration has brought to her young son and to their family, but also as a, as a, as a survivor of a murder victim and grappling with those tensions between wanting accountability for the man who killed her son, but also trying to grapple with, well, does accountability have to look like some, putting somebody in a, in, a, in, a, in a cell, a prison cell for 40 years, 50 years? So, you know, I like to bring attention to this interview because it's very emblematic, as I said, of a lot of the stories. They're complicated, they're nuanced. There's no easy answers here. It's, but this, I think, is the, the, the reason to do the work um, as difficult as, as it may be sometimes. So <clears throat> in 2020, last year, um, we were, we came into the year sort of <laughs> assuming it was going to be a great year for us. And we were planning on doing a oral history project with um, uh, survivors of violence. And my colleague Jane had a great idea you know, to again, a way of evolving our approach, our methods a little bit, we wanted to form a cohort of storytellers, essentially, that would be together as a group and work together every week. Um, and eventually, eventually, maybe there would be oral history interviews as a, as a result of that, um, and maybe a storytelling event at the end. But the idea was to bring this group together every Sunday at the home of someone we were going to work with um, to facilitate this project with us. And then COVID hit. And um, uh, like everybody, we, you know, I mean, first of all, we weren't going to be bringing together anybody, you know, uh, in person. So we put that project on hold and we pretty quickly realized that we had to do something about COVID in prisons. It was very clear from the very early days of the pandemic that this was going to be a crisis. Um, on the one hand, you had very smart activists who were saying, this is going to be devastating for not only people who are incarcerated, but also staff and families for people who are coming out of incarceration. And then on the other hand, you had state leaders, particularly in Texas, not doing anything about it refusing to let people out of jail and prison. And it didn't take long for the, the numbing statistics to, and numbers to come out um, about what was happening in uh, prisons where there can be no social distancing, where there was little access to um, soap and disinfectant. And where in the early days, there was really a nonchalant attitude by state leaders about what to do about this. And so we rec we basically put everything on hold, everything. And um, with a really great group of people that we've worked with um, for a long time um, as sort of advisors and interviewers, including um, 
our good friend Celeste Henry, who helped us plan this project and is one of the interviewers for the project, launched Sheltering Justice. And this project um, itself has grown over the last year in that, you know, initially um, it was a oral history or documentation and archival initiative around COVID in prisons or COVID and mass incarceration. But then after the murder of George Floyd and then the Black Lives Matter uprisings this summer, recognizing as many people are pointing out the twin pandemics of white supremacy and COVID. And so very much in the later part of 2020, Shelter and Justice has become a project to focus on those pandemics and how they overlap and reinforce each other. And um, uh, it's an incredibly powerful project. My colleagues, Jane Phil, Murphy and Carter, Celeste Henry, and the many others that we work with have done incredible work. I'm so proud of this project. I'm so proud of what we've been able to do here. And so if you're interested to learn more about this, we have an Omeka site, or I should say our digital archive is undergoing some maintenance right now. So a lot of our um, uh, materials are, are not available publicly. They will be soon, but this project we have on an Omeka site. And it's not only stories, it's um, people send us letters and essays and artworks. This is one piece by a man named Robert Vasquez who submitted to the Inside Books Project Archive, which is one of our, pro which is one of our partner collections for Sheltering Justice. Um, and uh, this was something we made for, with his permission, with a, um, for a podcast that we put out in collaboration with Dub Lab. Um, uh, to start to, to share some of these stories. So um, another, you know, in addition to the, the archival part that I mentioned as well, um, I think we're, you know, in many ways, it's been difficult to balance both doing the work and then also helping others who want to do the work and trying to be a resource for people and other groups who want to document state violence, archive state violence ethically, responsibly, inclusively. And, you know, we're constantly being contacted uh, for help with this and we want to be a resource. Um, and so um, one recent thing that we did in collaboration with Witness was put out two uh, resources for um, documenting interviews and also archiving um, materials related to um, related to police violence against peaceful protesters. So again, I sort of see all of that under this umbrella of this project. And, you know, we're really wanting to do, to do a lot more of that. Gabriel, you do have a few questions coming in in the chat if you wanna um, sure. go to those at this point. Yeah, um, I, one is actually most are related to this sort of context of partnering with different organizations, different groups, different sort of interests um, and, and the web of relationships. Um, Harpal had a question um, from the class earlier as well, um, asking what kind of relationship do you share with state prosecutors? How do you survive them? Um, and then there are a few others that we can move on to as well. We've never collaborated with state prosecutors, that's for sure. Um, but um, we, uh, we have interviewed prosecutors in the past and welcome those interviews, I should say. You know, it's, it was always a, um, a focus for our founder and the, the folks who were running the project in the early days who did a really, really incredible work setting up the protocols and our sort of internally the, the, the ethics of the work, um, particularly the first TV's first director, Virginia Raymond, who I worked with, thought, put a lot of thought into this. Walter Long, as I mentioned, who founded, and then others like Tony Cherian, who sort of taught us how to do the work, the oral history work. Um, uh, that was one thing that they were very interested in and open to was um, trying to document the stories of people that we probably disagreed with. And, um, you know, recognizing that as witnesses, as interviewers, as as oral historians, that it wasn't our role to, you know, to uh, to confront them, um, but really to witness their experiences as much as we may be repulsed by them sometimes and and personally, and that has happened. 
um, in the past, you know, having interviewed people who I just can't understand that they believe this thing that they believe, but, you know, we were really trying to, um, to, again, it goes back to trying to get a deeper understanding of, um, in that case, you know, specifically with prosecutors about how prosecuting death penalty cases, how overseeing executions impacted their life. Um, and, uh, you know, also creating a broader cultural historical record of the modern death penalty as well. Thanks. Um, there's another one in here from Jim asking, has TAVP's participatory research project led to any additional independent projects by Texas Advocates for Justice members after they've received training from you all? Yeah, I was really pleased to see how the people who participated in our project, what they've gone on to do. I mean, it's truly incredible. And, you know, one of the things that we did, um, in addition to the trainings around, you know, trauma-informed interviewing, uh, how to run the video camera, all the, you know, stuff like that, is we did put together a day-long training where we brought in um, people, journalists and writers or filmmakers, just to, to say, these are ways that you might, um, you might work with your story. And Texas Advocates for Justice, they're just an incredible group. And they've had a lot of really, um, really great victories in the last couple of years in their advocacy. And so they have gone on to do incredible work. And I should also say, you know, we've tried to maintain, we have maintained our friendship and our working relationships with many of our participants, and we try to bring them back in when we can to help us with projects as interviewers, etc. And we'll continue to do that. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, the last one that's sort of in the queue here in the chat, um, Mads apologizes for a threefold question, but um, Mads asks, what do you say TAVP has a trauma-informed practice of oral history? Um, and then if so, what are, some, uh, what are some practices or protocols you have thought through while considering the immense trauma and the potentiality of re-traumatizing in oral history interviews? How can you construct a space with your community member that considers trauma and safety in storytelling? I mean, that's really the name of the game here. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, just how do you do the work you know, how do you, what's something we talk about a lot internally at the project is the balance to the need to balance the urge to document the stories. Sometimes we want to go out there quickly, especially after a police shooting, for example, there are people who want to quickly grab their phone and go out and put it in someone's face and say, tell me what happened to you. I understand that urge. I really do. I think it's important in terms of a quick intervention, narrative intervention to the narrative that will come out from the media and the police. So I understand that. But the, to balance that with all of the work that needs to be done first around thinking through how not to harm the people that we're working with. And that has become the central, I think one of the most central parts of our work and always trying to evolve in that way. I mean, I've said to the, to the class before, we made a lot of mistakes over the years. We really have, and we've, but we've tried to learn from those mistakes. And, um, you know, the other thing I said too, is that I, in my own thinking, I moved away from this idea that we won't do any harm to the people we work with. I think anytime you ask somebody about um, loss that they've experienced or tragedy or violence or um, atrocity, anything like that, it's gonna be harmful to some degree. And so I think the question is how to mitigate that. So both on the level of thinking about re-traumatization as someone who's not a trauma expert, not a therapist, um, but still we have a responsibility. <laughs> I mean, this is something I learned from Mary Marshall and from her work around trauma oral history is the responsibility that we have to think about these, to be very serious about how we're coming into these interviews and to try um, on the one hand to recognize the importance of capturing the experience and the narrative, but also to try not to do harm. And so I think there are multiple levels as I was saying before. So there's there's the, you know, here are some practices that we've learned over the years for the time of the interview, but also the very real fact that one, we can do harm in our work before the interview, before the camera even goes on and well after the camera is turned off in terms of uh, decisions around um, 
what materials will be publicly accessible? When will they be accessible? How can they be used? How will they be described in terms of metadata or any, all of those considerations are what we need to keep in mind. And then also the big one, which I try to, which I think a lot about and, and trying to stay on top of it is, you know, legal exposure, um, particularly as well for the people that we work with. Um, you know, as I always say, there's always, uh, you know, um, recognition of the importance of, of evidence of human rights abuse in this work, but also the other side to the evidence issue of inadvertently creating harmful evidence. And, you know, that's something that we, again, are trying to always, you know, uh, push ourselves to be on top of that as we take on more projects that are dealing with, you um, uh, issues like police shootings or a, a loved one dying in a jail or prison. Um, so there's a lot to say there. And in fact, uh, uh, my colleague Jane has also put a ton of thought into um, sort of our, our approach to the interviewing. And do we call it trauma-informed? Yes, but also with the recognition that we're trying our best. We're always trying our best. We will make mistakes and we will do our best to learn from those mistakes. I don't think anybody has it fully figured out when they say they're doing the trauma informed work. I think they're just, they're trying their best and they're doing what they can while also trying to do the work. Yeah, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, Linda asked a, actually, I think relatedly to, you know, what you're describing of the sort of two sides of evidence um, that can come out of this in the relationship to, to the legal system. Linda um, notes the alignment, this the apparent alignment of your work with that of the Equal Justice Initiative um, mm -hmm. in Montgomery, Alabama, um, mm -hmm. and asks, have you had any connections with them as they work within individual states to connect the history of racial terror and lynching to the carceral state? Well, on a broad level, we are similar in that we see the the unbroken connection between histories of um, white supremacy and slavery and Jim Crow and all of uh, the horrific aspects of American history as being directly related to what we're seeing today in the criminal legal system. There's no question about that connection in our minds. And so we do, that's the approach to our work too. And I think, um, you know, uh, you know, that knowing that, understanding that makes a big difference in how we approach the work. More specifically, a couple of us did participate in a soil gathering in Oklahoma a couple of years ago. Um, that was uh, a site of a lynching. Um, and uh, we drove up one day and, and uh, collected the soil at the site of the lynching and then sent that off to the museum, to the memorial there. So that was, we were very honored, obviously, to do that. Um, but yes, obviously, the, you know, um, EJI has been a big uh, inspiration for us. And uh, um, as has Brian Stevenson, for many of us here, his sort of thoughts around stories and narrative and um, uh, restorative justice have all been very inspirational to us as well and how we approach the work. Thanks for spending on that. Sure. Um, actually, I wrote about Brian Stevenson in my application to OMA, if anyone in the room <laughs> remembers that that time. Um, so yeah, absolutely, you know, resonant, resonant here as well. Um, that's all the questions in the chat for now, if you wanted to, yeah, to let me return just to the slides. Up, uh, and, yeah, let me just wrap up the slides. I have a couple more things I wanna get through and then we can open it up again. Perfect. Thanks everyone for your questions so far. Oh, I guess that was my last slide, great. So um, I guess, you know, that was a very quick <laughs> overview of like five years of work. I mean, there's other things that we've done that I skipped over that I wish we could share more. As you can tell, I'm incredibly proud of the work we do. Um, I, I was telling the class that I, I genuinely believe in the role of this work in transforming how we, approach violence in our communities and how we approach um, accountability, how we think about these things. And I believe that it starts with the stories of the people who've lived through it. And, you know, so, you know, in the last couple of minutes here, before we open it up, I'll just say, you know, one of the things in my own thinking is, you know, we've 
built this archive of violence. I mean, this the, each story is really tough, really hard to get through um, because it's mostly about someone's loss. Um, but it's become clear to me as we continue to do the work that it's also an archive of survival and that these people have survived an incredible tragedy. And survival looks different for our storytellers, for our narrators. Sometimes it's that forced trajectory that I mentioned before where they become very, they devote their whole life to becoming an activist or an advocate, either on behalf of their loved one, trying to find the truth of what happened and how they, how they died, or so that it won't happen to another family again. And the, the times that people have told me why they choose to share their stories with us um, is because that's usually the answer that I hear the most is that they want so that it doesn't happen to somebody else. So that doesn't happen to another family. So that's why they feel like they will go through the experience of sharing this story on camera, essentially with strangers in the room um, now on Zoom. So um, that's a big part of it. And again, so survival that we've seen in the stories looks very different. Sometimes it's the activism, sometimes it's just the sort of quiet resiliency and the will to just move on, to go on with their lives. And, um, uh, but always, this is obviously always gonna be a core part of their being. And it's never like you get over a loss of a loved one, especially a violent loss. Um, so we've really been, you know, and it's a way of reframing it too, in a way so that the survivor, the, 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 the storyteller isn't then defined by the violence or the loss. You know, we often capture, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, healing and joy in the stories as well, which any oral historian in the group knows that that's often what emerges in the stories as well. And um, that's been really great and interesting for us to see. And, you know, we started to end, try to end some of our interviews with the question of what does justice look like for you? And, you know, I think that's the part of the interview where a lot of that dreaming and imagining and joy comes out. Um, and, you know, rarely, if ever, is that definition of justice the same definition that the legal system offers us. Usually it's something much more expansive, like, you know, living in a community where violence isn't met with more violence, or that, you know, where we can actually have accountability without putting somebody in a prison cell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have really shifted how I describe our work to think about, you know, the idea of an archive of survival, not just as a collection, a tangible collection of materials, but a way of being, but also the way that it can transform the witness, the oral historian, the, these stories, and also the potential to transform community and society. And, you know, I, I don't think this is a, a hypothetical um, possibility. I think it happens. I mean, in my own experience doing this work, how, you know, it, in the early years really de destroyed me in a lot of ways, you know, and bearing witness to these stories of loss, um, but also, working through that experience and coming out somewhat intact on the other side with a whole new understanding of these issues and of the role of uh, that we all play in essentially, you know, these responses, this counter violence, incarceration, punitive policing, et cetera, this is done in our names in the name of public safety or national security. So we all bear some responsibility here. And, you know, I become really interested these last couple of years in really trying to articulate that process of like, well, how do, you know, what is the role of oral histories and archives of, archives, archives of survival in changing a narrative? Because we always say, Let's, we're gonna change the narrative of this and that, and this is super important. But I'm like, what does that actually look like? You know, I really, on a granular level, what does that look like? And one thing that I found that I think is sort of interesting 
is looking at the process of victor offender mediated dialogue in, in the process of restorative justice. It's a, you know, I'm not an expert in this area by any stretch, but I am interested in it. Um, and, you know, one oversimplification of it is that one reason why it's so effective as a process of restorative justice, reparative justice, is that the harm doer accepts responsibility for what they did. And there are uh, scholars like Marilyn Armour and Mark Umbright, they have a book called Violence, Restorative Justice and Forgiveness. And in that book, they talk about when that process happens, when the harm doer is sitting with the person they harmed in this dialogue, that something happens there. There's a transfer of pain, the transfer of pain. And I can't help but think that that's actually what's happening in this work too, you know, in a different way when people engage with these stories, there's a transfer of pain. I mean, speaking as from a woman on oral historian as an interviewer, yes, that's absolutely the, the case. It's in that case though, it's more of, it's not because I haven't accepted the responsibility, but it's more as a witness. It's more as a process, a biological process of mirror neurons and just sort of being human and sitting with somebody and actually being a human and, and bringing in that pain and suffering into your own body. But in the case of state violence and sharing these stories and building archives of survival, the state, this you know, collection of actors who make decisions around policing and incarceration and capital punishment, the state itself can't accept responsibility like an individual can. And so there can't be this transfer of pain back to the harm doer in this process. And so where does that pain go? You know, and I think that in a lot of ways, what the, the, these projects I just went through, um, the work that we've done over the years shows that, <clears throat> yes, it goes to the person who experienced it, to the, to, the, to the survivor, to the storyteller, and what they do with that pain, as we've seen, looks different. Some become activists, et cetera. Um, but also it comes to us as the community, as a society, you know, and I think that you know, to what degree we're responsible for this, I think, you know, um, is our, you know, one could argue about the degree of our, our responsibility around this, but certainly there's some responsibility there. And so I could think the question becomes, how do we get people who think that their lives are, un are not impacted by the criminal legal system, for example, um, or, you know, I mean, so many things that we've seen in the last couple of years, at the national level, around the treatment of people. Um, how do we get people to take ethical action? Uh, you know, I think it was Durkheim that said that how we punish is essentially society having a conversation with, with itself about its moral identity. I believe that. And I think that this work, you know, it's a little bit cliche to say like an archive is like a mirror, but it really is in this case, these you know archives of survival that we're building. Um, so there's much more to say about all of that. I like that idea, though, of using victim of intermediate dialogue as a frame to think about the process of change that happens in oral history work, in archival work, and disseminating the work in a way that really gets people to engage with it, especially people who don't think that their lives are impacted by whatever issue it is that you're working on. So there's much more to say about all of that, but I wanna make sure there's enough time for a conversation and some questions. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Gabriel, that was wonderful. Um, and yeah, so much more to talk about. Um, there's a question waiting for you in the chat. If you wanna to turn to that and others, please feel free to um, add to the chat or if you'd like to ask your question out loud, give a, virtual or um, physical wave and we'll try to find you and, and unmute. Um, Alex asks, as oral historians, what role does race play? Given that much of the states that, given that much of the state violence is disproportionately targeted towards black Americans, what role do black oral historians play? Um, and a follow-up, is there a need for black oral historians to play a larger role or does the race of, oral, of the oral historian not matter? I think the race of the oral historian totally matters. I mean, I think the dynamics between the interviewer and the interviewee really, really do matter. Um, and as best we can to try to um, meet that need, whether it's language, uh, a language need, 
um, or somebody who has who has some degree of shared lived experience with the the narrator is better, always better. And so, absolutely, I think Black oral historians have a central role to play around documenting state violence and um, countering state violence and um, basically, as I've been saying throughout these projects, is playing that very crucial but sometimes difficult role of building relationships with people, building trust, documenting, and then working through that long, often long process of getting the interview into the public domain. And sometimes that doesn't happen, you know, sometimes because we got to be, be extremely careful with how we do our work. Um, at TAVP, we've had interviews that we've done many, many years ago that never make it to the, to the public archive for different reasons. So in response to Alex's question, absolutely, um, that the, the, the dynamics between the interviewer and interviewee certainly matter around shared lived experience. And as the best we can, as um, uh, people who, who plan these projects or put them together um, to try to build that team, I think is crucial. I have, a, I have a question. Um, and then there's another one that just came in in the chat. Mine might be overly specific um, and, and, and too hard to kind of access a, a memory of, but I'm curious, you know, you also talked a little bit about, um, well, for sure, you know, the, the um, Texas Advocates for Justice collaboration, um, the idea of getting directly impacted folks involved and potentially having them go out and do the interviews, right? That sometimes, um, someone who's not directly impacted, like can't be the right person to do a particular interview. I'm curious, I'm curious if you can think of any like particular questions, different questions that a directly impacted interviewer um, might ask that opens up a project in a completely different way um, that you and your team might not have been able to access if any kind of examples of that come to mind. I mean, I think specifically the the impacts of the incarceration project that was became very evident, you know, very quickly was that um, I think we would have done fine interviews. I think they would have been fine. I think they would have been important and 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 uh, usable for advocacy purposes, um, which was, you know, something again that, you know, over the years has changed and sort of how we do our work. We've increasingly moved to identifying sort of advocacy goals uh, for a specific project in addition to the goal of building the archive and, and and you know trying to shift you know public understanding of an issue um but yeah, on that project that was very evident you know i mean just uh talking through or asking questions around topics that we as people who haven't experienced long-term incarceration ourselves couldn't have known and couldn't have recognized was a central part of the story, central enough that it would make it into the very few questions that are typically asked in our interviews, because you know we sort of take a hands-off approach in our interviewing and not too many questions. So um, yeah, I don't know of a specific question off the top of my head, Carlin, but I will say that um, I would encourage you to check out some of those interviews. I mean, I, I did, they were just so incredibly powerful and so different than anything we'd ever done before because of that, like as that's the reason why they were so different. Um, and so again, it's gonna be interesting to see as we increasingly embrace uh, participatory um, uh, models around, again, not only project level planning, but I hope, you know, one day organizationally, it's gonna be really interesting to see how that impacts our work. And I can only think that it's gonna improve the, uh, the the impact of the of the the stories and the the archive and i want to i think alex said something else here i want to make sure to get to that yes yeah, so alex's follow-up was um thank you it's so interesting that you mentioned that because i found getting trained in oral history to be financially inaccessible um so these partnerships is a way to um redistribute a little bit um, and then another, and so I wonder if the setup of oral history has to shift if more black practitioners are needed. So this sort of whole apparatus. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the beautiful things about oral history is that is it's, you know, um, 
very much aspects of it, certain traditions of it are rooted very much in communities and ground up. Um, and, you know, I don't have formal training as an oral historian. Um, I don't think any of my colleagues do. Um, we, we learned doing the work, you know, and like I said, we made a lot of mistakes in the, on the, <laughs> in the process. Um, but um, I think that uh, there are ways to, to get the training um, in ways that uh, hopefully aren't financially restrictive, especially maybe outside of a, of a program or, you know, with a community, with a, with a community-based organization that might offer free trainings or very, very discounted trainings. I think there's a lot of free trainings that I've seen over the years by really excellent practitioners that I know that I know of their work and they offer free trainings. So I, I guess I just, um, yeah, I don't, I, 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 I believe what you're saying. And I, um, yeah, Alex, we can, we can, I can give you my email address and I, we can talk about some of those that I've seen come across emails, various listservs for free trainings. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for expanding on that. Mm -hmm. um, there are more questions coming in, but I don't want this this previous one to get buried um, from Shakita. What do you do with the interviews that do not make the public archive? So, you know, one thing that one of the things that we've learned in the early years was on the one hand, it's, you know, uh, as part of our wanting to be responsible and careful with doing the work, be a part of our main protocol was always to give our interviewees, narrators, the opportunity to review a transcript before anything is made public. Okay, I think that's one essential thing that we can do that makes a big difference in terms of making sure that everyone is on the same page about what's going to become public. I think this is particularly important around issues around violence where there's uh, someone has been experienced trauma. Um, the, the problem with that is that we, we're essentially asking our narrator after we do like a one, two, three, four, five hour oral history about the loss of their loved one to state execution, say, we would send them a transcript like a week later and then ask them to go line by line to review it. And I think that's a, not a very cool thing to do sometimes to expect that someone who just opened themselves up to you to then expect them to go through the transcript of it line by line to make sure it's accurate and to make sure that every, they're comfortable with everything in there being there. So, and I totally understand that. And that's why we've had interviews that we've done 10 years ago, incredibly powerful interviews that have never made it to the public archive. And occasionally as we've been able to, we've gone back to some people and said, where, where are you now on this? You know, some people has, have followed through with the process and signed and some still aren't ready. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, I'm willing to hold on to those interviews as, you know, confidentially as, we, as, as much as we can promise confidentiality. And that's a whole other issue about the promise of confidentiality for oral historians, especially community-based oral historians who don't who aren't working with institutions that have the resources, uh, for example, to fight a subpoena, say. Um, I'm happy to hold those as long as we can with the hope that one day <laughs> they'll, they'll go public. They'll, the, the, in other words, that the narrator would feel comfortable doing that. Um, and again, I will say that we've also shifted our protocols and our approach over the years, depending on the project to move away from that particular review requirement, but that's very rarely, and it's only when we feel comfortable doing that. And it's also only because we try to practice and we, we do practice ongoing consent, which is a, again, as it sounds, an ongoing process. It's not over the minute you get a signature on the consent form. It's an ongoing process. It's about relationship building with the people you work with. And also with the understanding that they can change their mind at any point. And even though if it's in the archive, it's out in the world, we do have a take, for example, one thing is we have a takedown clause in our, in our consent form. So people can remove 
an interview from the archive. Uh, but we just, and the other piece to the ongoing consent, which I'll say is just being transparent about this is how we're doing this project. This is what we think is most fair and um, tries to honor your dignity and your agency. These are what the, these are the aims of the project. We wanna reconcile those. Here are, the, here are the potential harms. Once this is out in the world, we will do our best to mitigate those. Um, and often I found that people still feel comfortable moving forward because as I said before, they want to share their story. They want people to know what they're experiencing. I mean, when we put out the initial call for sheltering justice, um, it, it was like, we had like 55 people sign up like within a day or something because so many loved ones of people who were incarcerated just wanted someone to listen to them about their concerns for what their loved one was experiencing with that the, in the early days of COVID incarcerated and no one that they were calling was listening. So I thought that that was really interesting that we had that immediate interest because here was a group that wanted to say, tell me what you're experiencing, what are you going through? So, um, so in response to the question, I don't know yet, but we are trying our best to practice what we preach in terms of always trying to be responsible and ethical around this. And so, um, so we hold on to those interviews and we'll go back, we'll circle back when we think it's appropriate and see where people are. And if they're not, and if they say, you know, they, we no longer want this interview to be public, then we'll honor their wishes and we'll destroy it. Thanks for expanding on that. Mm -hmm. um, there's another really interesting question from Kat that kind of sits in between that last question and the previous. Um, Kat asks, how do you consider harm reduction when it comes to the interviewers slash oral historians from the communities that are impacted? So sort of, you spoke to the sort of self-care built yeah. in um, with the class earlier, but if you could just kind of expand on that. Yeah, you know, again, this is one area where we've learned for over the years from those early days when I think, I don't know if I mentioned this here, but in the class I mentioned how in those early days, you know, we were doing multiple interviews a week, sometimes two in one day, um, which was uh, totally not sustainable around these particular topics. Um, and uh, so now, you know, we're very mindful of how many interviews our interviewers are doing in a week or in a month. Um, we, uh, you know, do small things like, you know, we pay our interviewers when we can and with our interviewers, we'll pay for a couple hours before the interview and a couple hours after the interview for a sort of no questions asked uh, self-care time. So, you know, we say, if you want to go to a yoga class or, you know, whatever you want to do, this is part of, we see this as being part of your work on the interview, as long as you take time for you and whatever you need in that time um, to, uh, to, to take care of yourself after you do these interviews. Uh, but there's so much more we could do and that we want to do. And it just comes down to time and resources. I mean, I think ideally, um, you know, maybe one day we can build in some budget, you know, we can build in a budget line to offer counseling services to our interviewers and to our team. You know, I think that's something that I, I, I know that myself and others in the organization, I think would be, uh, would want to do that. Um, and then the other thing too, is we're just very careful with the people who come into our organization, particularly our young interns, you know, and just saying, you know, this is the, this is the, the work we're doing and um, take care of yourself. And if you're not in a place to take on this work right now, that's okay. We can find work for you to do that isn't, you know, engaging directly with the transcripts or with the video of the interviews. Um, yeah, there's a lot there, but, and we're learning, you know, we're learning how to take care of ourselves because we, we recognize that, you know, there's not existing as an organization isn't an option. You know, we recognize why we need to do this work and why it's important. So we also have to figure out a way to, uh, to take care of ourselves and the people that we work with. Thank you. Um, Kristen is also curious about examples of questions that weren't asked in the interviews that, or that, that were asked in interviews that you might not have, have thought to ask, but we can, we can back burner that 
for a while and, and explore the transcripts as well, unless any have come to mind in the meantime. What's the, what is it? Um, like questions that directly impacted interviewers uh, might you. have asked that, that you wouldn't have yeah, thought to. I, but. It's, sadly, it's been a couple of years since the project, but, but, um, but the interviews are incredible. So I would, yeah. Yeah. And if you can't access them now, we uh, outreach us and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you access to them. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then a few folks are just asking about additional resources and, and additional places to, to look and to learn. Um, Sally asks about resources for following up on the idea of participatory oral history. And then um, Alex from before of uh, trainings or organizations for oral historians. Actually, um, OMA does some incredible trainings <laughs> that I've seen come around that are, I believe, free to the public or very low cost. Um, and there was this incredible group called Groundswell um, that unfortunately I think um, uh, are, they're taking a little pause, um, but I know that I believe OMA is absorbing some of those trainings that, that Groundswell had done in past years. And I found those to be really useful. I, I participated in some and also um, facilitated some of those trainings. But if I remember correctly, um, I, I hope some of the ground cell materials are still publicly available. Um, and I would also say to, to, um, to uh, uh, get on the OMA and the Columbia Center for Oral History email lists, because I'm seeing always seeing really incredible stuff coming across from these programs that I, I want to like attend every single thing, uh, but I can't. Um, and also, I would say, you know, increasingly TAVP is moving into that, that, that realm of trying to provide free trainings and resources to people. Um, uh, yeah, Amy is listing a bunch of other oral history programs as well. Um, and so I know that like right now, TAVP, we have some videos, very basic, nothing fancy, just some videos about um, sort of how we do our work. And then we're going to be adding more that we did as part of a different project, but we'll be adding them more about, you know, basic things like consent form, you know, you know, what to think about in developing a consent form. I do one about, um, I do one about, you know, the risks around legal exposure and things like that. So um, yeah, there's a lot out there. There's a ton out there. So I would in encourage, there are also some other trainings, but they're pretty high dollar um, that I've seen. And I, eh, I, I'd rather just go with some of the the ones that practitioners are uh, are offering as well that are free or super affordable. Yeah, lots of resources going into the chat here, folks. Um, Gabriel, thank you so much. I think I caught all the questions in the chat. If anyone has a last sort of burning one that you want to throw out there, um, you know, please do. But we are at time. Um, please join me in thanking Gabriel for a wonderful presentation and wonderful important work in the world. Thank you so much. I I do appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, folks who are here are probably, you know, interested in this topic. So um, I encourage you to check out some of our other workshops that have happened this um, year. Um, Serena Doftery's workshop from the fall talked a little bit about the Rikers Public Memory Project. Um, Nikki Yaboa's work and Holly Werner Thomas, both um, documentary plays to do with gun violence and, and survivorship. Um, so I'd recommend those. Our next event is next week, uh, Thursday, March 18th. Um, Storm Garner will be um, presenting on the Queens Night Market Vendor Stories Oral History Project. It's called Editing for the Mass Market, Tips and Tidbits um, from that project. So hope to see some of you there as well. Um, and keep in touch, uh, come back. Thank you, Gabe, really appreciate it.